to be honest, if we are not dealing with people and we're not dealing with feelings, you don't even need a real estate agent. Mm. You can just have a bot and say, okay, I want this. I want to sell at this price. That's it. You help me find. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Real Talk Real Estate where we share with you genuine real estate stories from the streets of Singapore. And today we have Amos as our special guest. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, we just want to find out a little bit more about you know uh, what you were doing before real estate. I heard that you have a very interesting job scope. So uh, could you share a little bit more as your role, on your role as a kayak instructor? Okay, uh, first and foremost, not exactly a kayak instructor but more of a kayak fishing guide. So I think this is a very niche uh, job scope. Uh, not everyone is a kayak fishing guide in Singapore. So I actually work with a company called Fever.sg. Uh, it's a really, really good company. Uh, treat me very well. Boss is awesome. His name is also Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, so it's a, it's a more of an outdoor uh, outdoor company where he focuses mainly on kayak trips. So okay. he started off with kayak fishing uh, and then after that, he slowly progressed to kayak sailing as well at the Pulau Ubin area. So I think that is oh. Oh. That is a very unique experience uh, for if any of you are like interested to go for an outdoor sea trip in Singapore, uh, escape from the city vibes, you know, go something that takes you outdoors. I think that's really, really fun. Actually, you took us out to sea before. Yeah. And then you had this special gear that actually can monitor where the fishes are. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So basically, yeah, so you asked me about my job scope, right? So basically, I meet people. I meet guests. Mm -hmm. Some of them who have been fishing for many, many years. Some of them who hasn't touched a rod and reel ever before in their life mm. and that was their first time ever you know, coming out with me so basically as a guide what you need to do is you need to make sure that um, all your guests they are well equipped in here their knowledge and also uh, with their physical capabilities you know they have to know how to handle a rod and reel they have to know how to paddle on the kayak they have to know how to steer the kayak because out in the open sea um, basically I'm their, I'm their one and only lifeline mm. okay if anything happens the only thing the only person <laughs> I can really rely on is the Coast Guard if I give them a call and that will take like probably 20-30 minutes for them to arrive as well. So I have to make sure that uh, the safety aspect is there and of course they make they enjoy their time, right? That 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 is what tourism is all about. So I bring my guests out. Uh, before that, I will have the briefing on shore, teach them how to use the kayak, teach them how to use the rod and reel, teach them how to put the bait so they don't hook themselves. That's very important. And then I bring them out on sea and that's where uh, all the fun happens. Lah. Bring them to the different spots. So like what you mentioned, we have this thing called the fish finder. Mm -hmm. uh, we use uh, from the brand called Ray Marine. So we use a fish finder, we bring them out. We have already allocated the spots that we believe uh, based on whatever we read on the fish finder, the sonar, that this is a good spot where fishes will be. Because fishes love structure and they're all around the structure. So we just bring them there uh, to the fish's real estate and that's where we hunt for them. Oh, yeah. I see, I see. <laughs> okay, but uh, what are the most unique fishes you have encountered while bringing you know, people out there? Well, actually we do have uh, a lot of very, very nice fishes in Singapore. Uh, I personally caught a diamond trevally off the off the shores of East Coast Park. There's a very very beautiful fish. Uh, Is it like we, a large fish or I, I don't? Yeah, it's quite know, it's quite huge. Maybe about this size. Ah, yeah, okay. I think that's pretty okay, decent. Uh, we have also caught batfish. So batfish is what you will be able to see at the Sea Aquarium. Okay, huge fish, very 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 nice, long fins, just swimming around, very very graceful. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of small ones are very very unique colors, mm. very bright. Yeah, actually, you also you know beyond kayak fishing, you actually go out to sea you know just to fish with friends uh, how is the experience like because for people who have never mm. fished before uh, people who have fished before they totally can feel the same excitement as you but for me over here if I've not tried it before uh, what, what is that draw because I, to me it just seems like a few guys standing under the hot sun <laughs> waiting for a fish to come like what is the excitement about it I think the thrill is you never know when it's going to bite so, so that's the biggest thrill and you never know what size of fish you're going to get so in Singapore everyone always say uh, uh, yeah, Singapore fish all very small la. small small fish yeah? you go out spend hundreds of dollars and then get like small fish back but uh, I beg to differ because it depends on the boatmen that you hire uh, different boatmen have different expertise mm -hmm. and uh, fishing itself there's a whole lot of genre that you can go into jigging baiting you know ajing there's just so many different genres that you can go in so for example if you're baiting you have to go with a boat captain that is very really good at baiting and depends on your target species you can 
can go to Changi, uh, you know, to the southern side, Sentosa, okay. or Raffles Lighthouse, or even Tuas. So it depends on what you're what you're hunting for. Night fishing also. Night fishing, you you go Changi probably uh, you you don't get anything good. Night fishing always Tuas Tuas always delivers. So it depends on what you're aiming for, what you're hunting for. I think that really depends on what kind of fish you're gonna get. I see. And the thrill, the biggest thrill is when you hit a monster. You know, when you're a fishing, uh, <laughs> you're not you're you, you're aiming for oh, maybe about two three kilo table size. But when a five to ten kilo fish gets on your line, uh, and you feel that weight at the other end, you know this guy is a this guy is a monster, and the adrenaline pumps and the, the adrenaline rushes right, and you and you think to yourself, am I going to land this fish or am I going to let it get away? Yeah, I think that that, that is the biggest thrill. When you actually mention about your experience, you know, and the adrenaline of catching fishes, it just reminds me of when we are trying to deal with real estate clients. So I want to ask you this question. What drove the shift from, you know, your your kayak guide job and then to a real estate agent right now? Ah, fa- good question. Uh. Actually, I've always wanted to join real estate for quite some time. Uh, however, you know, there are a lot of obstacles in the way in me getting my my license and passing the exams. La. But of course, um, that was something I was doing while studying for my real estate license. Uh, and the idea has always been to jump to real estate but it's a matter of when so I managed to get my license within two years la. and then now that's where I am and what connection do you feel uh, from your skill set as a kayak guide right to real estate agent I, I just <coughs> off my mind right now is patience obviously mm. uh, but what other skill set do you think you know is very very uh, transferable to real estate I think it's the connection that we that we have with people because it's all about connection but to be to be honest if we are not dealing with people and we're not dealing with feelings you don't even need a real estate agent mm. You can just have a bot and say, okay, I want this. I want to sell at this price. That's it. You help me find. <laughs> you know, but but it's very different. You know, when you're buying a home, when uh, you're going into real estate, if let's say you're not an investor, you're a homeowner, uh, you, you are looking to upgrade, there are so many feelings involved, right? So you, we are dealing with people, we are dealing with real people with real feelings. And you have to address that issue, right? Bots can't do that. So I think that's something, uh, when I'm a kayak fishing guide, I deal with guests all the time. I take people out every single day. I meet different people from all walks of life every single day be it tourists be it locals be it kids uh, be it grandparents yeah. or just parents or just couples young couples you know I mean all of them and I think it's very important that you stay relevant with them mm. so how do you how do you give your guests a good time out on water you have relativity to, with them yeah. right you can talk to them about their life you can share about your life they can share with you about their lives and vice versa yeah. you know you can talk to parents you can talk to kids you know you can talk about memories there's just so many things to talk about and it's all about the connection activity that you have with them I see. you know the personal relationship yeah so I think that's something that is very very relevant to real estate also because we're dealing with people all the time from all walks of life um, people with different levels of income some lower middle some middle income some high earners right so all walks of life different people every single day so I think that's that's the unique part of the job so how do you actually approach your property sales like uh, when you speak to new clients uh, and then they are completely you know needing some advice do you find that you know being a kayak guide right you're actually helping them navigate through the outdoors to the unknown mm. of the real estate world yeah I think that's a very very nice way to put it mm. because they are literally entering uncharted waters you know uh, they go into buying a house without knowing what is it how do I go about it uh, what is it wh- what do I look out for basically um, so when I'm there I talk to them I get to know them I know their needs I know what are the main concerns and that's where I can share with them my expertise like okay so based on uh, your current situation your goals I think this would be the best case scenario for you if we can achieve that that would be great what do you think about it mm. ah so sometimes ah, when they listen to like hey this, also this is the solution ah, but I have another concern ah then slowly you you dig deeper and you find more and more concerns that without an agent ah, they will never be able to figure out themselves it's, yeah. it's very relevant I mean the whole experience right if you can put it very visually is that you bring them out in the kayak they're trying to figure out how to move forward mm. and then finally you bring them to the right spot okay we we all we as realtors we do not know where can make money you know <laughs> because uh, I mean if, if somebody were to tell you that oh you know you buy this unit you confirm make money or something no we are here to tell you that based on our findings obviously we have tools you know to, to check out you know this area that area seems to be underpriced and then out of this selection the customer actually choose you know like okay I think I don't mind this one and then we put in our own uh, mm. inputs into it and finally they caught the right fish mm. <laughs> yeah so uh, could you share 
one of your most memorable deal? Most memorable. I would say every single deal is memorable because ever since I joined the industry, I've been doing one of each. So for example, uh, industrial rental okay. for tenant, HDB buyer, uh, private seller, private buyer. So I've been doing one of each. But I think the most memorable one, uh, the one that I really, really put a lot of time into is uh, my buyer that purchased a, 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 new, a new launch. So I think that, that was very memorable because from wanting to purchase a resale, she actually dig, dug deeper and found extra reserves to be able to purchase a new launch which could have possibly you know be something much better than the resale that she originally wanted to purchase and we happened to purchase in like a slightly different area also mm. so they want to put in a lot of time uh, there were a lot of uh, work done past midnight you know all the research you know uh, coming out of the presentation decks to share with her my findings so I thought that was really 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 interesting uh, I really enjoyed it I enjoyed the whole process we want to catch your property insights in a moment but we just want our listeners to find out a little bit more about you. We're mm. going to go through a little few <laughs> rapid fire <laughs> questions. All right. So, uh, are you early bird or night owl when making property deals? Night owl. All right. Condo with a sea view or penthouse in the city? I would say penthouse in the city. Can I give a reason why also? Why? Because uh, property with a sea view, uh, what do you see at East Coast? <laughs> Ships. Uh, let's say uh, the East area, um, Pongo, Pongo sea view. You, you look at uh, Johor's refinery. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I would like a penthouse in the city. Uh. All right, awesome. Uh, would you kayak or yacht for a day off? I would like kayak because I like to do things on my own. If I if I go on a yacht trip with a friend or, or, or a yacht trip with friends, I would have to follow the captain's uh, schedule, mm. right? If I have a kayak on my own, I can just go out by myself and enjoy myself in the in nature. But more tiring, lah. I'm okay. La. <laughs> <laughs> Your top two in real estate. Top two meaning like uh, is it using SRX or Property Guru or 99.co or you know a certain app on your iPad or something? like that mm, uh, of course Propnex Investment Suite and also Property Guru very good company yes. man yes. so uh, what's the quick tip for a first time home seller first time home seller uh, engage a realtor lah, for sure <laughs> <laughs> alright alright okay so we just want to find out a little bit more because you actually have a lot of expertise in uh, new launches so I just want to find out from you how do you evaluate new launches like which one do you think uh, you know how, how do you evaluate to know that this certain project you know can buy one hmm, okay Coming to that topic, I would say it's not whether or not the project can buy, but in totality, you evaluate your client's current situation. What is your client looking for? What is your client's needs? And does this project suit your client? Mm. That is what I would do lah for my clients. I don't say, I, I, I don't promote a project and say, hey guys, this project can buy one. Just go and buy. But lo and behold, you know, it, doesn't, it might not suit your client's needs. Mm. Right? So you understand their needs first. You do a little bit of needs analysis. I mean, cliche, but true. Mm -hmm. You know, you do that and you understand where is your client coming from? from and how can I add value to my client when they are on their search for a new launch okay mm, because at the end of the day they can say hey I want to buy a new launch but I need to move in within one year can or not so how do you do that mm. you know if you go for the, the newest shiny thing uh, maybe 3-4 years then you can move in so that's not ideal right and sometimes you know there are a lot of new launches in the year people get so caught up with the new ones that are coming up that they forgot all older projects that are still new haven't even hit their TOP but they are still available units in the market and cheaper and look location might be better also mm. than the ones that have just been released. So I think sometimes we shouldn't let like the new projects blindside us and we can also look back and think back on the projects that are still around, cheaper, possibly better in location that can suit our clients' needs better. So assuming timeline is not a factor, means mm. uh, a pure investor who just want to make the most number of dough, mm. uh, how do you evaluate for them like a new launch, you know, what are the key factors of a new launch to, you know, seemingly uh, make it successful? Okay, so just based on statistics alone uh, uh, of course looking at the statistics we can't say for sure 100% okay, so just based on statistics alone uh, we look at a new launch the higher amount of units in the project the better it is so we look at like maybe a 600 unit project versus a 200 unit project which project would do better needless to say it's the 600, 600 uh, unit project mm. because there's a higher volume of transaction when they hit TOP or even before TOP when they hit uh, past their 3 years uh, SSD mm. seller stamp duty so they, they will start putting their, their units on the market ready as a sub-sale. Right, so higher volume of transaction, they can always bench on the previous transacted to bump their price up. Okay. So looking at a 600 unit project, I think that would be better. Uh, also depends um, if let's say you're talking about investor point of view, you want to go for a, a higher return on equity, right? How much you put in versus how much you get back. You look 
at where your unit is facing. Generally, the pool facing units are more expensive than the outside facing units. Mm. However, if your outside facing unit is facing a small road with little or no noise, isn't that a better purchase as compared to a pool view unit? Mm. For somebody that, that, you know, likes to hear the kids shouting and screaming over the <laughs> weekends, I think of course, it, yeah, then you get a pool, pool facing unit. Lah. I see. But if you like tranquility, you know, quietness, then maybe get a unit that faces out into a small road. I think that's great. There are a lot of units that, uh, there are a lot of projects that have these kind of units there. I see. Okay. Mm. So what are the trends for the new launch in Singapore right now? Yeah, so like what I said just now, um, there are some older projects that can suit your client's needs. So for me, I don't necessarily think it's uh, so-called a trend. But based on what I see uh, in the market right now, there's one uh, word that can describe a lot of buyers is uh, FOMO, fear of missing out. Yeah. So they see a new project coming out, even without thinking whether or not uh, this project is for them. They say, wow, everyone is rushing to the show flat. Everyone is giving yeah. in their checks. I also want to put in my check. But they don't even know whether the project is for them. right? So they just, they just put in their blank check. And when it comes to unit selection, they, they don't even know which unit to select. Mm. And then they just back out. Right. Even though they might have a very, very good queue number. Okay. They just back out. So I wouldn't say that there's a there's a trend. Mm, because at the end of the day, everyone has different preferences. Some people want uh, windows in the kitchen. But the new the newer launches, they don't have windows in the kitchen. Right? Mm. Mm. I see. So, okay. One final question regarding new launch. Um, how would you uh, advise a client who is, you know, very concerned that the real estate market for new launches, you know, the price is so much higher than resale. Mm. How do you make sense of it in a terms of uh, investment point of view? Mm. I think in Singapore, Singapore is a very unique country. Uh, real estate prices will always go up. In the past 60 years, maybe 30 years, we, we don't see Singapore prices go down. Everything has been on, on the increase all the way, even until now. Mm. Uh, you talk about new launch, now prices are very expensive. So what is expensive? 3,000 PSF? Yeah. So we, we, we take a, just one case study, just South Beach residences, okay, uh, bought at 3,000 over PSF. But do you know how much PSF it, it was sold just <laughs> recently? 4,005 PSF. Is that high? But people are still buying. So there is always a market. The real estate market is always moving, be it recession or recession. People will need to buy a house. People will need to sell a house. Yeah. So there's always demand and supply. But how much demand, how much supply? It depends. Lah. So it goes up and down. Lah. But demand and supply is always there. That's what I feel. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also, what is expensive? Last time, uh, say Marina Bay residences, right? Uh, PSF was 600 uh, when released. But now how much? 2000 plus or so. Mm-hmm. So is it expensive? Last time, 600 expensive. Like. East Coast was 400 PSF. <laughs> Now also 2,000 plus what? All right. So what is expensive? So it will always be expensive. La. But mm. I guess for buyers right now, because of the high amount of supply, mm. I guess it's a good time to, you know, relook into the market where, you know, high interest rate, fear of recession is actually putting off some buyers. But for those buyers who, you know, feel that they are in the more, uh, or rather they find that their current career progression is pretty secure, they have some funds to invest. I guess uh, with people, you know, scared to come into the market and then with the oversupply right now, right, uh, it'll be a good time to come in. Because by 2030, uh, I mean, the estimate, estimated population will be 6.5 to 6.9 million people, which is right now we have the 5 million mark, right? So therefore, the demand will definitely be there. And the supply, looking at the land scarcity, is just not going to look good for people who are going to be on the fence uh, mm. for, for too long, especially if it's for their first property. Yeah. So, okay, moving forward, right? Because you actually sold, uh, you know, some of the properties for your clients, right? They're actually at a very, very good price. So I just want to ask you, what are some of the strategies that you actually apply you know, to help sellers to achieve a good price. Uh. Mm, I think most importantly is to have your seller have a realistic price in mind first. It can be higher than what was being transacted previously, yeah. but have a realistic price so that people will, hey, will know like, hey, you know, this seller is serious. Mm. And not just putting a price out there, uh, oh, if you can get, can get. If you cannot get, don't get. Law. It's okay. Yeah. But <laughs> have a seller that is realistic. So you put a you put a realistic price. Uh, for me, pricing strategy, how would I, how I would do it is I would go slightly better below what my seller is asking okay. and I will put the quote starting from. So when people inquire, they already have it in their <laughs> mind that, okay, if I if I offer, it has to be minimally that. Mm. You know, I can't lowball. Like if I put negotiable, ah, yes, you know, people maybe give me like 30,000 less than what my seller is asking. La. But if I put starting from, lower than what my seller is asking, then we slowly bump the price up from there. Yeah. Because especially for units who which are well renovated, they look good, they will naturally draw buyers in, right? And at the end of the day, as realtors, we don't want to lie to the market. We don't want to tell our fellow agents and also um, the direct buyers that 
inquire and say, hey, we got a last rejected offer. This is the amount. But we don't want we don't want that offer to be a lie. Mm. We want to draw real, genuine offers and let our seller know and say, hey, you know, we have this offer right here. But I feel that this offer is not high enough for you. Mm. Can we just keep that offer first? And then we wait for more offers to come in. Okay. And then we let we let buyers offer themselves. And um, one of my scenarios is uh, I had two people offering for one unit and it became a, like a small bidding wall. Lah. It didn't go more than three counter offers, but we managed to hit a price that is 30000 above what my seller originally asked for, mm. which I think is a very, very good uh, good deal for her. I see. Yeah. But how, how do you manage the buyers? Like, what, what do you tell the buyers to make the price justifiable? Because they probably tell you that, hey, but it's so far away from the last transacted price. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what, what do you tell them? I think getting a rough valuation of your property is very important also if you are serving a seller. So if they ask you this question, is the price within the valuation? It is. So who justifies the price? Mm. The banks do, right? Uh, and also, you buy the latest iPhone. Mm. Who justifies the price? <laughs> Isn't it so expensive? Yeah. Last time, how much How much was an iPhone? $300. Right. Now, two, two, $2,000 just for one iPhone. But you still buy it. It's expensive, but you still buy it. <laughs> because you get used to the price increase over the years. Same thing for housing or solar. Housing or also increase over the years but slowly and it, it has become a norm to pay for a price like this for a house mm. HDB how many $1 million HDBs now mm. that, that, that have been transacted I'm sure. who would have thought HDBs would hit $1 million? <laughs> and now this year I think we got about 50 sorry not this year this quarter we have about 56 if I'm yeah. not wrong so uh, I just want to I just want you to share a little bit more to our listeners right who is feeling the pain uh, of waiting for their BTO <laughs> you've been waiting for it for the last few years and then I uh, just want you to share your experience like what was the journey like you know do you feel like uh, if I would have just bought another property you know and then and then I don't have to to you know wait for this or what was the struggle mm, okay so I think a BTO for myself and my wife was the right choice to do okay so a little back story a little back story we chose our BTO in September 2019 okay. that was when my wife back then girlfriend was still studying so we had a lot of grants because I was the sole breadwinner mm. so I, I only I had income my wife was a student and we booked under the fiancé fiancé scheme right uh, our flat was really really cheap you look at four rooms now they are going for 600 600 over thousand even some even 700 over thousand yeah. we got ours at 359 highest floor corner unit with a partial sea view so I think that's really really good <laughs> uh, that was 2019 la. so of course we we knew that BTO has a long waiting time but because our current situation allows us to have uh, this BTO like we don't have to move in immediately mm. so we are not looking at resale we had the timeline yeah. to cater for a BTO. Mm. So so I thought BTO was the, the right choice. La. But of course, waiting time, uh, in the first two years, it didn't really matter to us. But as we got married, well, we got engaged, we got married, and then we just started to look at the timeline and it didn't really match. La. So I think painful part, that's the part. La. <laughs> because at the end of the day, I would have preferred that uh, after we got married, we immediately moved into our matrimonial home. Mm. So I think that's best case scenario. Um, but because we chose a BTO instead, um, my wife moved in with me and we have like this one year time where we are not in our home together as a married couple. Okay. So, uh, have you, <coughs> I mean, now that it's like 90 over percent completed in the BTO mm. side of things, uh, you have scouted for some interior designers. So, mm. what, what are your design plans or renovation? Okay, design, I leave it entirely up to my wife <laughs> because I am very flexible. I'm okay. You know, whatever design you want, I'm okay with it. I'm not, I'm not that particular. Only thing I'm very particular about is the kitchen. So, it has to have the cooking appliances that I want. Yeah. Uh, my tools, my knives, my pots and pans, uh, everything has to be done the way I want it to be. Because I'm the one using the kitchen most of the time. I see, I see. Yeah. So, uh, what are the challenges or joy of setting up your new home? I mean, obviously now you have not officially moved in, but mm-hmm. even the start of the process of it, I think some of the listeners who maybe uh, in a younger uh, or age group kind of setting, right, they are still wondering like, well, if I want to, you know, get uh, my BTO, you know, what? how does it look like for me? So maybe you can share a little bit more about, you know, what are the joys and struggles of setting up a new home. I think the most fun part uh, in this whole process is the purchases. You know, so going around, finding uh, finding the perfect sofa, finding mm. the perfect bed, the mattress, uh, the pillows, bolster, blanket, uh, all the kitchenware, you know, uh, <laughs> buying things when they are on flash sale. I think that's the most exciting. <laughs> la. They say, hey, wow, suddenly we walk into Takashimaya. Whoa, hey, uh, La Croce got sale. Ah. Okay, la, buy. La. So we buy all the small things 
then we make sure that it's uh, according to our theme lah. So we just slowly buy, 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 buy. So the house, uh, current house is filled with uh, all our pre buys. I see. Yeah. So when we move into our house, then uh, everything is going to be put nicely lah. I see. So okay, not necessarily for you, but moving forward, you know, in the next five to six years later, right, where somebody uh, who owns a BTO, you know, actually uh, MOP, uh, do you have any you know best ways for them to navigate uh, in the HDB market, especially for today? If let's say somebody who have waited for the last five years, right? Finally, they managed to to MOP. Uh, what's your best advice for them? Navigate HDB market only. Uh. If let's say they want to like to upgrade to a condo or mm. like they want to maybe move from a four-room flat to an EA or five-room, uh, you know, what, what, what's the best way, uh, uh, general advice actually? Mm. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, it really boils down to the client's needs. Uh, that, that is what I really operate my business model on, my client's needs, instead of what I can uh, share with you what's available in the market mm. right so there are a lot of different scenarios that I can think of um, then again if you think about it that way also from now let's say you get your BTO now today at this point in time five years down the road your financial standing will increase significantly both you and your spouse mm. so maybe a combined income of 8,000 may even be a combined income of 14,000 then mm. you know what can you move into right so there are, there are many different ways if uh, the BTO is your first subsidized housing where else can you go for your next subsidized housing if you want to maximize the, the most out of it because how much is your BTO and how much is your return on equity when you sell your BTO it's very high mm. what can you channel into for your next property so if your income doesn't go past the ceiling cap I would strongly suggest uh, you to go into an EC mm. because ECs now uh, are different EC than ECs back then ECs back then the takeout rate was so high mm. you basically can't even get the unit that you want because everyone's bidding for it but now due to the oversupply like you mentioned mm. ECs there are so many leftover units so many choices for you to choose from so what you can do is after you hit your MOP apply for an EC mm. you know go into an EC maximize the use of two subsidized housing and then you, what is your return on equity for your EC is going to be significantly more than your BTO mm. and that's going to set you forth uh, your return on equity maybe uh, your BTO 300,000 and your EC maybe 350,000 your return on equity is 650,000 where you can choose to move into your fire forever home already then yeah. and, so I think and of course there is the deferred payment scheme right of you course. can literally wait for the EC to Correct. complete then after you sell within 6 months and mm. there's a bridging loan as well yes they will take the estimated valuation of your current home and then bridge give you a higher loan just to you know cover mm. that portion yeah. so, so I think the, the sorry think, you were, yeah. so adding on to that uh, I, yeah. I think the beauty of moving into an EC after your BTO if you're still within the ceiling cap uh, the beauty is that you don't have to move out and rent while, wait, while waiting for your EC to be to be built. Mm. You know, not like you're upgrading to a private property. If you're upgrading to a private property, you have to sell your house, your, yep. your BTO. You have to rent somewhere for the next three, four years right. before your, your condo TOPs and then you move in. Yeah. Right. For EC, I think the beauty is you can continue living in your HDB until your EC is built. And then yes, you have that six-month period where you have to sell off your, your BTO and move into your EC. Mm. So I think that's the, the beauty of it. So, so basically, I think what you're trying to say is that if you have the BTO profits, right? Uh, there, you know, how do you actually use the profits to actually progress your asset? So I think this is like heavily used in the real estate market, especially mm. among agents. So actually, how some clients, you know, you can go to EC, you can go to a private condo, or some even want prefer lifestyle, which is like if I'm staying in a three room or four room flat, I want a really large EA in Tampines, for example. Mm. Um, and then the whole family can enjoy. I think that is you cannot put a price to that actually, <laughs> because the whole family can enjoy a bigger space you can uh, you know if you have number two the number two kid coming out number three kid coming out I think everybody can enjoy that kind of space but I think one of the structures just to add on is to uh, you know if you can buy under one name and then five years later uh, the the other name can be used to buy a private property without ABSD I think uh, we will dive more into that uh, in the next few episodes to come but uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, so far we just want to end off with a few more uh, rapid fire questions so that we can really get to know you even, even better so, um, question for you is, what's your favorite fish to catch? Grouper. Coffee or tea during property negotiations? Tea. Coffee, too, too strong the smell. <laughs> One word to describe the Singaporean real estate market. Singaporean real estate market. Uh. Affluent and high liquidity. <laughs> Biggest adrenaline rush. Catching a big fish or selling a major property deal? I think selling a major property deal. Yeah. Come on, commission. Uh. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> last book you read or podcast you listened to? Uh, not really a reader. And... Uh, I can't really sit still. That's why I'm in real 
estate because I can constantly move around. <laughs> okay. The most underrated quality in a real estate agent? Empathy. Okay. Yeah, uh, if, if I'm willing to dive deeper for that, uh, I think a lot of people, when they have an agent that understands them better, mm. they tend to, cannot say everyone, but uh, I've experienced it, they take advantage mm. of you being able to understand them. Mm. And when a ruthless one comes along, mm. they go along with them instead. So that's a little bit heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is. So I guess um, in this job, there's a lot of uncertainty. You yes. know, you can give your 100%, but that doesn't mean that, you know, everybody is like so nice to. Yeah. yeah but we, we just do our best nonetheless. And, of course. And yeah, we believe that God will provide. Nah. So, okay, what's your dream vacation destination? Wow, I think South Africa. South Africa? Yeah. Oh, to see the uh, safari, safari zoo. Okay, awesome, man. One piece of advice for someone looking to join real estate? Importantly, must join the right team. So, of course, uh, I, I, I joined the right team. So, it does really help to propel uh, your work mm. much faster than should you join the wrong team. Having the proper mentor, uh, the proper tools that is being passed over to you, I think that's the most important when you enter the industry. All right. Thank you so much, Amos. And for you listeners out there, if you have any real estate stories you want to find out in the next few episodes, please uh, comment down below and we will see you for the next episode.